So the responsibility of any believing human being is to protect themselves from the hellfire and protect their dependents and their family members from doing anything that could lead them to the hellfire. So it's a responsibility. Yes, first and foremost, we are responsible for ourselves, but we are also responsible for our families. And this is a profound responsibility. And this means on the day of judgment, when each one of us stands in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the reckoning, for the hisab, for the account, you will be asked about yourself. And on top of this, you will be asked about your family. What did you do to protect them from the hellfire? So it's a responsibility and you will be questioned about that. You will be held responsible and accountable for whether you did or you did not effectively act to protect your family members from the hellfire. Where does this lead us? <clears throat> it leads us to realize the importance of our families and that we are responsible for them. Because in the minds of many people, of many fathers. So in this khutbah specifically, I'm addressing the parents. And more specifically, I'm addressing the bread owner in the house, mainly the father. Because we tend to think, or many of us tend to think, that being a father is only about bringing food onto the table. Only earning a living and providing financially for the kids, making sure they eat well, they dress well, they go to school, and that they grow physically healthy. We think that's what being a father really means. So we limit it to that, only to that duty. And when it comes to the mothers, a lot of the mothers think that the responsibility is that she has to give birth, clean the child, wash their clothes, prepare their food, and that's it. And that's it. So, in a sense, some of us have reduced parenthood and the beautiful position or role of being a father or a mother only to physical needs. Only to physical needs. But this verse defies this kind of understanding. That Allah says, your responsibility is protect you, to protect yourself and your families from the hellfire. So being a father or a mother is not limited to just providing for them, looking after their hygiene, you know, helping them buy clothes and go to school and just physically grow to become adults. That's not what parenthood is about. Rest only, only about that. It's more, it's more than that. So it's important for us to see ourselves as parents that we have to protect our children and our spouses from any way that could lead them to the hellfire. Again, there is another misconception that is common among us. We think the only way as a father to protect my children, children from the hellfire is basically to give them some teachings about Islam, educate them. Educate them about Islam by sending them to school, to weekend school, Quran school. Or by teaching them personally. If you know Arabic, you know Quran, you know some hadith, you know some fiqh, you teach them. Which is a great thing to do. An important element of raising our kids. But we limit it to that. Because I can see a lot of parents are actually doing well in this regards. They try to secure... Islamic education and Islamic awareness for their kids. So they go through some kind of curriculum, some kind of teaching, some kind of guidance. They try their best. If they themselves don't know, they make sure they send them to a qualified teacher, a Quran teacher, or an Islamic school that hopefully will be able to teach them Islam. I'm not going to talk about the shortcomings that we have in the way we teach Islam and in our curriculums and in our, the way we conduct our schooling. That's a completely different topic. But at least when someone doesn't know as a parent how to educate their kids, they don't have the knowledge, so they, they, they trust the teachers, they trust the schools that are around because that's the best that they can do. So that's a good thing, but that's also not enough. That's also not enough. 
Because as the kids grow, grow, as they reach their teenage years, you will find, you'll start to find that the kids, the boys and the girls, will start to be more connected to their friends in school, in the neighborhood. They start to confide in them and trust them more than they trust their parents. So, so they start to learn from their peers, from their friends, more than they learn from parents or their teachers. And sometimes this actually gets worse to the point where they start mixing up and taking as friends people or people who are not actually, people who are not qualified to be good friends. People who don't have faith at all. People who have developed bad habits, who have bad practices. People who have gone into the wrong way in terms of their conduct and their behavior, in terms of their practice, in terms of their ethics, in terms of their beliefs in terms of their lifestyle. So when the kid starts associating with such people, they will start to adopt these behaviors and these practices. They will start to do things that are haram, things that are considered to be major sins. And they would listen to their friends and their peers and not take advice from the parents. And the parents would start to feel some kind of disconnect. My child doesn't take my advice. When I try to advise them, they turn a deaf ear to that. They avoid having an honest and open conversation with me. They'd rather hear and listen and take advice from their friends, from someone outside the house. There is definitely a reason for that. It's not happening randomly and haphazardly. The child all of a sudden, you know, switches their mind off when they have a conversation with their parent. This is a very common problem. And the consequences are more serious because the kid starts to trust people who are unqualified to give advice or people who give them the worst type of advice that will set them up in their life and push them away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yes, the society we live in is quite challenging these days. There's a lot of philosophies. There is a lot of notions and lifestyles. There are a lot of practices and lifestyles that go contrary to ethical principles, that go contrary to belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that go contrary to the teachings of Islam, that they go contrary to even any kind of decent living. So when the child goes to middle school, high school, university, the workplace, they are exposed to people from different lifestyles, different life orientations. And some of these people are quite attractive. They're very well spoken. They carry themselves quite well. They know how to express themselves. Sometimes they're well off, they have resources, and that's attractive to many people. Sometimes these people are successful in their profession, in their business, in their work, in their relationships and this is an attracting factor that draws people towards them so when the parents have lost their child from a young age by disconnecting emotionally to their child by only viewing parenthood was about feeding them and clothing them and sheltering them and sending them to school and maybe educating them in, a, in an academic way but what about the human connection? Did the, did the child feel, their, feel they really had a friend in their father? Did they find a friend in their father? Did they find a friend in their mother? Could they, did they find a safe environment at home to speak their mind and ask questions and express their emotions and share their concerns and ask and seek for guidance without being put down? without being threatened, without being questioned, without being demonized? Did they experience a safe environment at home where they could really, they could find the best friend in their father or their mother and they could freely speak with them and take guidance from them? Or do the children only feel that their parents were policing them all the time? Were screening them and surveilling them all the time? And all they always having suspicion, evil suspicion about them. Never give them the benefit of the doubt. Searching for the slightest mistake and catching them and making sure we make clear to them how bad they are, how evil they are, how weak they are, how bad their intentions are. And we think, I'm a good parent. 
I caught them doing the wrong thing and I pointed it out to them. And what happens? It disconnects. Because they can't find a friend in you. They can't feel safe in your presence. When they are at home, they feel they are being screened and watched all the time. So they have a need to lock themselves up in the room. So they can feel at least safe and not being watched. Because being stirred at all the time is quite an exhausting experience. That's not going to fall easy on some ears, I understand this. But if we don't see the consequences that are going to happen 5-10 years down the line because of this, when we have forgotten that this is the reason we don't make the connection, then we start running around searching for help. My child is losing their deen. My, ch my child is taking drugs. My child is having a boyfriend. My daughter is having a girlfriend. My child comes, comes late. They only come home at 2 a.m. I don't know who they spend time with. They come with a smell of alcohol. They come with a smell of weed. When I speak to them, they never take my advice. And when they grow and have more freedom and independence, you can't do anything with them, right? They're way beyond your control. So where did, how did all this policing, what kind of payoff did it give? It didn't give anything. We, we have to remember and keep in our minds that we live in a society that's open. In a Muslim country, predominantly Muslim country where there's Muslim culture, you can, you can leave the education of your child, you can leave it to some extent for the society. Because everyone in this society, they, they take it as a responsibility to teach the child. The whole flow of the society, of the culture, keeps the children somehow safe from very bad things. So you can probably count on this, but when you live in an open society where people can do whatever they want, people can espouse the beliefs they want, people can say whatever they want, people can destroy their lives and the lives of others through any means, by substance abuse, by a lot of negative practices. Your child is susceptible to that, they are exposed to this. So it's easy for them to fall into that. They see it in school, they see it in university, they see it in the street, they see it in the, see it in the neighborhood, they see it on TV, they see it online, they see it in the workplace. And we know that we humans, when we reach our teen teenage years, we have a lot of emotional changes. We start, our outlook on life starts to change. We want meaningful relationships and if we can't find this at home from the father and the mother and the siblings, people are going to search for it outside. And the problem is when you have in school or outside in the street, when they have people who would listen to them, people who would give them some kind of validation, some kind of respect, some kind of regard. And these people are doing bad things but they will rush to them because of their desperate need has not been met at home. I mean, you can argue against this, but facts remain facts. They are brutal, as bad as they seem. That's what our youth are going through. There's a disconnect. We want our children to live our own culture. We want them to live our own times. Times have changed. Times have changed. We have to see what's going on in our society. We have to see what our children are experiencing. What kind of pressures they are going through. They have to deal with a lot. They are being accused of being terrorists. They are being accused of being weird. They can't take boyfriend, girlfriend. They can't party. They can't mix, mix like others with the opposite gender. There are so many things they cannot do. But in school, in university, at work, these people do these things on a daily basis. Well, kids cannot do that. So they are looked down upon. This is a pressure. There is a lot of peer pressure from the school, from the teachers, from the system, from the... Their, their, their classmates, from their peers, from others. Then now they are questioned as being Muslim. You are terrorists. Then they are tormented by teachers and professors about the conflict, this supposed, the so-called conflict between religion and, and science. Then there are philosophical issues offered to them where they challenge Islam on an ethical basis. And they create, they frame ethical issues in a way that goes against Islam. And the kids are faced with all of this. And the kids remember, at home, all they had to do with religion was forced to be prey. 
forced to pray, forced to dress up in a certain way, forced to be in a certain way, never got the time to have a human connection. Some people don't even sit for dinner together as a family, or for lunch as a family, or for breakfast as a family. Some people don't even live at home. There's no life at home. There's no life. The family doesn't get together. So the reason I quoted this khutbah at the beginning that we think saving our children from the hellfire is by feeding them and clothing them and then securing some kind of Islamic education for them. What about the connection? A boy needs a father figure in the house. He needs to experience the love, the concern, the connection, the care of his father. That his father is his mentor. So he spends time with his father, quality time. You spent time with your child, with your daughter. The daughter needs her father to grow, to, to feel that she is loved, that she's precious, she's appreciated, she's important, she's valuable. She needs to feel this. When she doesn't feel it at home, she's going to search for it outside. And when, another, when a guy connects with her on social media, sending her some nice, sweet words, he can ensnare her and play around with her mind. And we say, I don't know what happened to my daughter. You haven't given her enough love. That's the reason, or one of the reasons at least. The daughter needs her father. She needs her mother. She needs to be connected. You need to spend quality time with them as a family. It's not a mechanical relationship. We're not robots. Just provide physical needs. It doesn't work. The emotional connection could be far more important than any other physical need. They need to have your presence at home. Yes, life is hard sometimes for some people. Life is challenging and demanding. But it's not worth losing your kids. Some people have their problems, the problems from work, the pro problem, financial problems. They have them on their mind 24-7. At home, they're only making calculations. They're only thinking about the pressure at work. They're only thinking about the demands upon them. So the kids are playing around, speaking with them, and they can't give attention to their children. And they say, I'm spending time with my kids. You're not. You have to be present. You have to give them your heart. You have to give them your, your attention. You have to give them your whole self at that time. Spend time with them. Take them out. Take them for a trip every now and then. Spend family time, precious family time. Make this the best memories in their life. Let them feel safe to come and confide in you and express their concerns to you. So they don't have to search for that outside. And when this escalates, you will lose them at some stage. And we don't want to do this. So secure that emotional connection.